Jesse Harding Pomeroy was just 14 years old when he began claiming the lives of others. Although he was only a teenager, his crimes were so horrific, violent, and bloody that they were up there with some of the worst killers we have covered here on Twisted Minds. They say kids will be kids, but killers will be killers. Welcome to Twisted Minds. My name is James, and today we take a look at the case of Jesse Pomeroy, the youngest serial killer in American history, who was dubbed the Boston Boy Fiend. Jesse Pomeroy was born in Boston in 1859 and was the second son of an alcoholic dockyard worker, Thomas Pomeroy, and his wife, Ruth. By all accounts, Jesse was a smart kid, although he did have trouble socializing with other children because of how large he was for his age, the white membrane covering his right eye, and the epileptic seizures he suffered from. What also isolated him was his hatred of sports, preferring to spend his time reading penny magazines which told the bloody tales about the Indian Wars. In fact, when he did play with other kids, it was often a game called Scouts and Indians where he would opt to be an Indian to reenact the numerous torture techniques of the day. In the 1800s, was this not seen as a red flag? Jesse had been a sickly baby, shortly after birth developing a serious illness. He eventually recovered from this serious condition, but it resulted in him being quite small and frail at the age of seven months. This illness, however, resulted in scarring around his right cornea, leaving a noticeable white mark covering his entire eye. Nonetheless, Jesse bounced back and became healthy, apart from the injured eye, and eventually became a happy and playful chubby toddler. While the young boy seemed to be like any other, his mother did notice something odd about her son. It wasn't that he was a bad child, but he wasn't a nice normal child either. Sadly, Jesse was the victim of some nasty physical abuse at the hands of his father from a very young age. The most common abuse he suffered was being taken out to the outhouse toilet, stripped of all his clothes, and whipped with a belt until he began bleeding. Horrific. When Jesse was just five years old, his neighbor claimed he stabbed a cat to death and threw it into the river. Before his 10th birthday, Pomeroy killed his mother's songbirds by tearing their heads off. As we all know, many killers started off killing animals before moving on to bigger prey. While this is the story believed by many, Jesse's childhood struggles are still debated. Some historians claim that his Civil War veteran father used to abuse him awfully, while others claim that he actually had a very normal upbringing with his brother Charles. Whatever the truth may be, one thing is for certain. It wouldn't be long until the young boy became a teenage killer. One of his teachers said that he was peculiar, intractable, not bad, but difficult to understand. Of course, many children are like this and grow up to be just fine, but in the case of Jesse, it was a foreshadowing of what he was about to become. Jesse hated being corrected by his teachers and eventually took solace within himself, spending much of his time reading his beloved pulp novels, especially the stories about the brutality of the frontier life. Jesse hated being disciplined, feeling an injustice over whatever the punishment was, no matter how small. One argument that was brought forward about the origin of his evil ways is that it was the violent dime magazines that were responsible. Doesn't that sound familiar? With some people blaming video games for inciting violence, it seems that never changes. Jesse preferred the magazines published by the Beatle and Monroe publishing houses. His favorite series was based on the grisly exploits of Simon Gurdy, a real life renegade white man who led the Shawnee Indians on an infamous massacre of frontier settlers in the 1780s. As you hear more about the crimes of this young boy, you will no doubt see the inspiration from those old cowboy and Indian magazines. Although Jesse would go on to take two lives, those poor souls were not the only ones to be mistreated by the 12 year old. The first crime committed by Jesse Pomeroy happened on December 22nd, 1871, when the young son of Mrs. Payne was persuaded to come with the 12 year old Jesse to a place called Powder Hill near Boston. There the little boy was stripped naked, tied to a beam and beaten with rope until he passed out. Although the child survived, Jesse wasn't identified as the perpetrator at the time of the vicious attack. 
On February 21st, 1872, a little boy named Tracy Hayden was taken to the same place as the previous victim by Jesse and underwent the same awful treatment. This time, however, the boy was hit in the face with a board, which broke his nose and knocked out several of his teeth. On July 4th, 1872, Jesse enticed yet another young boy named Johnny Balch to the same location and abused him in the same way as the others, stripping and beating him. This time, however, the boy still had the strength to walk with his attacker to the Saltwater Creek, where Jesse forced the boy to wash all of his cuts and gashes with salt water, an act that would have left the poor child in excruciating pain. In September of the same year, another young child named Robert Gould was led to the Hartford and Erie Railroad track, where he was tied to a telegraph pole, stripped naked, beaten to an inch of his life, and cut on his head with a sharp blade. Like the other boys, Robert managed to survive the ordeal. A few days after that, little Harry Austin was approached by Jesse and was stripped naked, tied up, and stabbed with pins until he passed out. Jesse, who was out of control, only waited a few more days after that to attack his sixth victim, George Pratt. This time, he persuaded the boy to follow him into the cabin of a yacht and bound, stripped, and beat the boy. Afterward, he stabbed him in the back and groined with a penknife. Despite the treatment, the poor boy survived the attack. Just under a week later, a young boy called Joseph Kennedy was lured to a secluded spot on Old Colony Road, South Boston. Once again, the child was mistreated in the same way as George Pratt and also managed to survive. At the time of the crimes, many boys were arrested on suspicion of committing these vile crimes. Eventually, attention fell upon a boy named Jesse Pomeroy, a 12-year-old living with his mother, who was a poor dressmaker. Several of the victims identified the boy as their attacker, with no doubt of his guilt. This led to him being sentenced to the Westboro Reform School for the remainder of his young years. At the time, it was custom for children at this school to be let out on good behavior, as long as they could prove that they would go to a good home during their probation. Unfortunately, this was done in Jesse's case, and on February 6th, 1874, the monster was set loose. Straight after being released, he moved to South Boston with his mother, who is now running her own dressmaking shop, and his brother Charles, who was selling newspapers. On March 8th, 1874, John Curran, who was living close to Jesse Pomeroy's house, notified the police that his 10-year-old daughter, Katie, had mysteriously vanished. The only clue they had to go on was from a witness statement from a child who saw a little girl matching the same description as Katie Curran enter a buggy with an odd teenager. As the missing girl was described as attractive and well-developed for her age, the police suspected that it was a case of abduction with sexual motives. Sometime later, Katie's remains would be found hidden in the basement of Jesse's mother's dress shop, mutilated and hastily burnt. Before that discovery, however, there was to be one more final act of pure evil to be formed by the young killer. And this time, it would be his youngest victim yet. On April 22nd, 1874, the body of a four-year-old boy named Horace Millen was discovered in some marshland near Dorchester, Boston. Like Katie, the body had been severely mutilated, with 31 knife wounds in total. In fact, the attack was so brutal that he had been almost completely decapitated. Of course, Jesse was responsible for both of these murders. So, what made Jesse the way he was? Well, some believe that it was his early exposure to violence fueled by life events that made him the killer he was. This brings up the time-old question. Are there some people who are just born to kill? There is actually a lot of evidence suggesting that some people have a genetic disposition to aggression, which, combined with unfortunate life issues, create killers like Jesse. After everything he did, there is no question that Jesse was a sadist. While being a sadist is bad enough, Jesse was more likely a psychopath. Often people who are psychopaths have a desire to hurt others and don't feel empathy or compassion toward other people. They are also willing to put their own lives at risk to achieve pleasure, like abducting young boys and tying them up in places that anyone could walk in on at any moment. 
Although psychologists are hesitant to diagnose a child or young adult who commits these kinds of depraved crimes as psychopaths, they have found a pattern that falls under the same umbrella of disorders. These include having a god complex, being cruel toward both humans and animals, a lack of empathy and remorse, avoiding making friends, and being a prolific liar. Excluding Katie Curran, whose murder was a crime of opportunity, Jesse preyed upon boys who were on their own and were aged between four to eight years old. He would lure them to isolated areas using different stories or excuses, such as going to see something super interesting together or hiring them to help him with an errand. Once they were alone, however, Jesse bound and stripped and tortured them while masturbating to get his sexual gratification. His attacks eventually escalated to slashing and stabbing with his fifth victim. After being imprisoned in an institution, it seemed that a new plan had taken root in his mind, which was ready to sprout the moment he was released. This change of MO saw Jesse slashing the throats of his victims, as well as stabbing their genitals repeatedly. He often threatened his victims with castration, a threat that must have been terrifying to the young boys. But he only carried it out on four-year-old Horace Millen, Poor, poor child. With the bloody past of Jesse Pomeroy, the police naturally suspected him of Horace's murder and took him into custody. During the search, a knife with blood on the handle was found. Also, his shoes were covered in mud that was similar to the mud found in the marshlands. This led to the police going to the marsh and finding footprints in the mud. Footprints that they made plaster casts of to not only match the same shoes as Jesse, but also the way he planted his feet when walking. There were also witnesses and other little pieces of evidence on and around the body that pointed the finger at Jesse Pomeroy. During an interview involving Jesse and an officer, the officer asked if he knew the boy, to which Jesse replied, yes, sir. The officer then asked if he had killed him, to which Jesse replied, I suppose I did. Finally, he was asked how there was blood on the handle while the blade was still completely free of any blood. Jesse told him, I stuck it in the mud. Following the confession, the police deduced that the boy was perfectly sane, but was a fiend who got pleasure from torturing those younger than himself. You have to remember that this was almost 150 years ago when psychological study was in its infancy. They also deduced that he chose children only because he had the physical ability to force them to do what he wanted and because he could overpower them because of his size. Now, do you remember when I told you about the discovery of 10-year-old Katie's body? Well, in July of the same year, Mrs. Pomeroy's landlord sold the property where she was living and working, and the new owner decided to make some improvements. Laborers began to excavate the cellar, and at about 5 p.m. on July 18th, they discovered the badly decomposed remains of a little girl buried under a pile of ashes and stone. Among those who viewed the remains were Katie's own parents, although all features were unrecognizable. They did manage to identify her, however, through the clothes she was wearing. Jesse instantly admitted that it was he who killed the young girl, after hearing that his mother Ruth and brother Charles were being arrested as accomplices to the murder. This changed everything, as although Jesse was standing trial for Horace Millen's murder and not Katie's, the new development led to his lawyers dropping the innocent plea and instead claimed innocence through reason of insanity. The jury wasn't convinced, and in February 1875, Jesse Pomeroy was found guilty of Horace Millen's murder and was sentenced to die by hanging, the only penalty for this charge at the time. That should have been where this story ends, but after the execution was delayed for a year, the sentence was commuted to life in solitary confinement after two governors refused to sign a death warrant. For the next 41 years, Jesse's sole interactions were with the guards and his mother, who visited him once a month until she died. In 1917, Jesse was allowed to join the rest of the prison population, proving that his risk of violence was not extremely low. As he barely got any visitors, Jesse devoted nearly all of his time to reading and studying. By all accounts, he became a highly educated man. In 1929, he was moved to a prison farm due to his deteriorating health. Just three years later, at the age of 72, he died from natural causes. In prison, Jesse claimed that he taught himself to read several languages, including Arabic, with one psychiatrist once commenting on how good his German was. 
He also wrote his own poetry and argued with prison officials to get his work published. He even studied law and spent years trying to overturn his conviction and get a pardon for his crimes. In 1914, a psychiatrist made a report on Jesse, claiming that he made 10 to 12 attempts to escape prison using handmade tools. Luckily, all these attempts failed. A prison warden also found rope, steel, pens, and a drill that Jesse had concealed in his cell or on his person. According to the report, Jesse lost one of his eyes after trying to blow up one of the walls of his cell by redirecting a gas pipe. To quote the psychiatrist's report, Jesse showed the greatest ingenuity and a persistence which is unprecedented in the history of the prison. In other words, this bird was ready to fly to the coop. By the time Jesse Pomeroy died, America had coined a term for the type of crimes Jesse had committed, a serial killer. I know what you're probably thinking, Jesse only killed two people, but according to the American Psychological Association, the hallmark of serial killers shows a specific pattern of selecting their victims, locations, and the method by which they kill. Over his lifetime, Jesse Pomeroy had spent 59 years in prison and reformatories, making him the longest serving American prisoner. To this day, there is only one other person in America who could challenge Jesse for the title of America's youngest serial killer. This monster was called Craig Price and lived on Rhode Island, who killed his first victim in 1987 at the age of 13. He then killed two more people at the age of 15 before finally getting arrested. Thanks for tuning in to Twisted Minds. That was the case of Jesse Pomeroy. And why don't you go ahead and click on one of the two videos on your screen for another one of our videos.